Hebrews chapter 5 is where we're going to be heading to tonight, Hebrews chapter 5. We'll continue our study in Jesus is Greater, and we are just motoring right along, aren't we? We're doing all right. Hebrews chapter 5, we're going to start it tonight, we're going to look at the first seven verses, and then guess what we'll do next week? Not finish the chapter. We'll look at like three verses next week. That's okay. We're getting there. We're making our way through. We're making progress. So as we look at this tonight, we're going to look at Hebrews 5, the first seven verses. And this is kind of, again, a reoccurring theme that we see throughout Hebrews. And it piggybacks so well onto the tabernacle after we studied it and the priests there. Uh, we're going to look at our heavenly high priest. We, we saw last week that he was the great high priest. And none, none better before or after him. Uh, no one could compare. And tonight we want to look at our heavenly priest. And what we're going to do tonight is, as we look at these verses here, these first seven verses, you're going to see a comparison made. Uh, and you're going to see a comparison made between the earthly high priest and the heavenly high priest. And, of course, ours is the heavenly high priest, Jesus. And, and so we want to kind of break that down and show you these things through these verses. And, again, a reoccurring theme throughout the book is not just that Jesus is greater. We, we see that throughout the entire book. But also that Jesus is our great high priest. We see that continually played over and over and over and over through the book. Um, as, as you've read up to this point, we're up to chapter 5. Uh, in chapter 2, he was described as a merciful and faithful high priest. And we talked about how we were thankful for his mercy. Uh, we're thankful for his faithfulness to us. And when we don't always uh, stay the course, he always does. Uh, chapter 3, we saw he was the high priest of our profession. Uh, and, of course, salvation brings us into that relationship uh, with him and with God. And in Hebrews chapter 4, we covered last week, uh, again, we saw that phrase, our great high priest. Uh, so as we think about that tonight, we'll look at two specific topics. I know this isn't a three-point outline, so I'd fail hom homiletics or hermeneutics or whatever the classes are, you know, that I don't care about anymore because I ain't in college. But, uh, <laughs> amen. But, uh, uh, <laughs> so we'll look at two thoughts tonight, okay, uh, about this thought of our heavenly high priest. Uh, let's look at the first um, five verses here together, get us reading, uh, and then we'll look at the last two verses uh, in, in with our second point here. Uh, so look at uh, chapter 5, verse number 1. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he might offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, but for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. And by reason... Hereof he ought, as for the people, so also for himself, to offer for sins. And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but that he said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. And so as we look about uh, at this topic again of our high priest, we're going to look at the, the comparison made here. And so the first one is the earthly priesthood. That's what we want to look at. And I know we, we spent some time on that when we went through the tabernacle. I understand that. Uh, but these first few verses kind of bring our memory back to that. So we want to point out some thoughts about that. Uh, so the first 10 verses or so of, of chapter 5, you see this contrast made between the earthly priesthood and the heavenly priesthood of Jesus Christ. Uh, you specifically kind of see that in verse number 4 and 5. You really kind of see that uh, emphasis made there. Uh, the earthly priesthood, of course, is mostly represented and thought about it as, as Aaron. He kind of got, was the one that uh, was that first high priest uh, designated and appointed by God. Uh, God set him apart as the priest. Uh, the people would follow him then. And as they made their way through the wilderness wanderings, it was Aaron that was in charge at that time. And then, of course, you know, kind of things went down there from Aaron. But he was the first one. So as you think about the earthly priesthood, we're talking about men. We're talking about uh, men, hopefully, who were um, you know, spiritual and, and leaders and, and following God and all that type of thing. But we're going to see kind of some of the things that are laid out for us in these verses about the earthly priesthood. The first thing I want to point out is this. I want to look at his appointment. His appointment. That's not like a, you know, 8 o'clock. Got an appointment, okay? Uh, I'm talking his placement, okay? Uh, his, his choosing, his selection, uh, you, you see a little bit about this in verse number 1 as well as verse number 4. Uh, let's look at his appointment and point out a couple things. First of all, the priest did not take the position on himself. Okay, He was appointed by God. 
He was appointed by God. Now, in our churches today, there's a lot of people that volunteer to do different things, right? And you're usually thankful for that. But usually when you get into a position of a lot of leadership uh, uh, and, and oversight and things like that, usually it's kind of one of those things where the person who's not saying, oh, me, 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 pick me, pick me, pick me. It's usually some guy who's not doing that, but is just willing and it fits, fits the mold, right? Uh, so, so this person was appointed by God every time. It wasn't just a random thing. It wasn't, uh, oh, let me flip a coin. Let me see who's out there. God had a plan through this and through every earthly priesthood, of course, starting with Aaron himself. So he was appointed by God. Now, stop for just a minute and think about that. Think about that for just a moment, okay? The position the high priest had, he was hand-selected, not by Moses, by God. That's pretty impressive, that's, that's a pretty neat deal. So, so you think about the earthly priesthood, his appointment, number one, he's appointed by God. Secondly, the work of the high priest involved things pertaining to God. It involved things pertaining to God. We saw that in verse number one. If you, uh, if you go back to Hebrews 2.17, uh, you don't turn there, but it says this, Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, uh, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. So you see that even on God's part, or Christ's part as the high priest. But we see that the involvement of the priest was not for his own pleasure. It was not for his own promotion. It was not for, hey, this is how I take care of him. This was, the, the work that he did was all God's. There was no credit to be taken on his own. There was no, hey, this is my, uh, this is my church. This is my ministry. This is my Sunday school class. This is my, but this was, hey, this is God's. Uh, the credit was given to God. The service was for God. And everything the high priest did involved things pertaining to God. Uh, verse number 1, again, points that out very clearly. Uh, it says he's ordained for men in things pertaining to God. Uh, number 3, you see this. Um, only God can rightfully select the high priest. Um, God called Aaron. God chose Aaron. <laughs> We look at Aaron sometimes and think, well, he kind of messed up, didn't he? Sure. Well, so did a lot of people that God chose to lead. I look at that and I think, what a great reminder that he uses flawed people. Amen? And uh, he forgives our past and lets us move forward into a, into a future that can serve him. Uh, God's the only one that has that right. Okay? Uh, this wasn't up to Moses. It wasn't up to a council. It wasn't up to a, a board of people uh, voting and, you know, they had to be unanimous. God chose him. God chose him. Uh, and by the way, if God's the one doing the choosing, you can count on the choice being right, okay? It's not left to chance or hope, hopefully this turns out, right? Uh, his appointment by God, for God, and only God had the right to do it, all right? Uh, so that's his appointment. Uh, look, at, uh, look at next, uh, look at this earthly priesthood. Look at his assignment, his assignment. Verse number one, again, points these things out. Uh, the first thing you see about his assignment is this. The Old Testament priest's assignment was to, uh, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. That, that was his duty. That was his job, if you want to say it that way. That's what God called him to do. There was one man that could offer, especially, especially the sacrifice on the Day of Atonement. Okay? There was one man that was qualified by God to do so, and guess who it was? This man. <laughs> This man who was appointed, this high priest. Uh, so his assignment was not, you know, uh, you know, serve the widows. His assignment was not, you know, uh, clean the tabernacle, take care of the, uh, of the sacrificial animals that are going to be brought. No, his assignment was, was, was pretty plain and pretty simple. You are the one called upon by God to offer the sacrifices. Now, again, with a specific assignment like that, it was a little bit easier for the people to put their faith in this man. Again, I... You and I today would probably still say, well, I still struggle with that because he's still a man, right? But again, things were different then than they are now. You know, we have Christ who is perfect, okay? They did not at that particular time. And so this, this gave him kind of that authority figure that, hey, this is what he does. This is the one we're trusting in our relationship with, with, with God. Uh, so he, he was to offer uh, both gifts and sacrifices. Number two, when you think about his assignment and offering those gifts and sacrifices, uh, it's a reoccurring thought, okay? And here's what it is. The basic problem with all people throughout the centuries has always been a sin problem. So his assignment was to deal with sin. <laughs> how wonderful, right? How exciting is that? How encouraging of a, I get to listen to people's problems. I get to point out people's sin. And I get to help them deal with it. And I have to, yeah, 
You talk about carrying a load, <laughs> all right? You talk about being burdened for the lives of other people. Um, this was his assignment, uh, to, to offer the gifts and sacrifices, but also to deal with the sin problem of the nation of Israel. And if you studied the nation of Israel at all, you talk about sin problems. <laughs> they weren't the, uh, the, the, the greatest people in the area of avoiding sin, were they? <laughs> they struggled with it throughout their entire history. Uh, and, and so that was, his, that was his assignment. I offer the gifts and sacrifices. I'm that go-between, like we have Christ. I'm that go-between for people's sins and the offering of the sacrifices to get the, the forgiveness of the sins. Uh, if you look at this, number three, I put this down. Christ uh, was not only the priest, and we covered this when we talked about the tabernacle, he was also the sacrifice. So Christ's role as high priest was a little different. The high priest, earthly-wise, he offered the sacrifices. He, you know, he helped in that area of sin. He would, he would try to help you, you know, just, or not justify, but rectify those things in your life and get them forgiven. Jesus just said this, I'll be your high priest, I'll be your go-between, but I'm also the one that's going to pay for your sins. So Jesus filled the dual role, whereas the earthly high priest could only do the one, which was the offering of the sacrifices. So you see his appointment, you see his assignment. If you look at verse 2 and 3, um, the, next, the next thought comes from verse 2 and 3. Look at his approach. His approach. How did the high priest approach his position? Again, you know, it, it's got to be a humbling position, first of all, because God's the one that chose him, okay? It's also got to be one of those positions where you're thinking, wow, this is a daunting task as well. I got to deal with a lot of people. And when you deal with people, there's always problems. Doesn't matter what arena of life you're in. When you deal with people, there's problems. We're sinful in nature. That's us, okay? People equals problems, right? And, and so the, the priest had to figure, well, how do I, how do I fulfill this role? How, how do I approach my position that God has chosen. I didn't choose this. I didn't necessarily want this, but God chose me. God placed me. God called me. How do I, how do I look at this? How do I fulfill this? I think what you'll see um, is, is two thoughts here, okay? Uh, I, I think I see two things about his approach. The first one, if you look at uh, verse number two, it said, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. We'll talk about that here in just a second. So, so first of all, his approach, I think, was this. It was one of compassion. I don't believe the high priest ever looked down uh, you know, from some lofty position and said, well, I'm better than you. Well, you've got this wicked sin you need to deal with, and I'm the only one that can help. I don't ever think it was like that, okay? I think the high priest was, was filled with compassion. He had to be. He had to be to deal with the, the, the sin that was going to present him on a daily basis and to fulfill what God had called him to do. Uh, so, so it was one of compassion. Um, it gives us two thoughts about who he was compassionate towards in verse number two. It uses the word, it says, have compassion on the ignorant. Now, if you're from Kentucky or West Virginia or maybe Arkansas, you probably say ignorant, <laughs> right? You don't quite say the whole ignorant. But uh, you talk about having compassion. Did they say that in Arkansas, Eddie? No. Ignorant. Ignorant. <laughs> okay. All right. Close enough. <laughs> yeah. All right. So you know you have different. You have different people say it different ways. Let's just put it that way. But but what does that mean? What does that mean? Have compassion on the ignorant. Well, look, let me give you a thought here. The word ignorant. It's referring to those who don't know better. Yeah. <laughs> those those who just simply don't know better. Um. Here's here's a thought. Scripture teaches this. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Okay? I think as Christians are first saved, they're, they're new babes in Christ, right? They're, they're learning. They're growing. Boy, it's a big, it's a big curve, right? There's, there's a big change that has to take place in their lives. You think about somebody saved out of some you know, wicked, horrible past, and God miraculously changed their life, and they're beginning a new life in Christ. You know, they're made new. they got a lot to learn, right? And, and somebody who's been saved for 40 years and has studied the Bible and has maybe been to seminary or you know, taught Sunday school for all these years and really poured their life into the Bible, they have learned a lot in Scripture that that guy doesn't know. However, if you want to look at it this way, that same act that he knows not to do and he doesn't know to do could still be considered sin. He's doing it in ignorance 
This guy would do it willfully. Does that make sense? And, and so the compassion was on the ignorant. It wasn't, well, you should have known better. If you would have listened in your, uh, uh, what do they call Jewish school? Jewish school? <laughs> in, your, in your classrooms, at, at your Jewish school, if you would have listened to the teacher and to the instruction, right, then, then you would have known this by now. The priest didn't do that. He had to have compassion. Uh, he had to have compassion. He, he had to have patience, grace, <laughs> long-suffering, kind of like Christ, amen? Uh, so, so his approach was one of, of, of compassion. Uh, the word ignorant, those who did not know any better. But then it used a second term. Um, in verse number uh, uh, 3, and by reason thereof he ought also for the people uh, so of himself to, uh, uh, to offer for sins. I, I, I missed my, miss my verse here. Where's it at? Hold on, let me find it. There we go. Verse number 2. Before uh, It says, who can have compassion on the ignorance, right after that, and on them that are out of the way. So you have two aspects here of his compassion. The ignorant and then out of the way. Those that are out of the way. That's referring to those who are living in open rebellion against God. These are the ones who say, I know I shouldn't, but I, you know, it's just it's hard, you know. It's just hard not to. <laughs> and so they know they shouldn't, but they are. And the priest had to learn to be compassionate to them. And I want you to think about this. Is it easier to be compassionate to somebody who's ignorant of something, sin-wise, or somebody who says, I know I shouldn't, but I'm going to anyways? It's, it's easier to have compassion on the guy that doesn't know. He's still learning, man. Give him some grace. It's easier to show grace uh, to a newborn babe in Christ because he's learning, man. He's just, he's just dipping his feet in the water. He's just getting there, right? But that guy's been saved a while, and he's like, I'm just going to do what I want anyways. It's like, you want to strangle that guy. You should know better, right? Compassion is a little tougher. So this priest had to learn to deal with both of these, these situations. Uh, both of these sinful situations, he had to learn how do I show compassion? By the way, none of us are high priests. Well, we, we're priests with God, but you know what I'm saying. We're, we we're not in this position. But but should our should our uh, um, example of compassion still be the same? We still need to learn to show compassion to people, right? And I know some are harder than others, and situations are more difficult than others, just like he's facing. But that's how he had to approach his position that God called him to: compassion. You know what? That's how we ought to approach our compassion or our, our position as children of Christ, should we not? Compassion. The second thing you see about his approach, though, is this: uh, you see him approaching it from measured suffering. Measured suffering. Who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed or compassed with infirmity? And by reason hereof, he ought, as for the people, so also for himself, to offer for sins. Measured suffering. The, the word here for compassion is a combination of two Greek words. Now, I know most of you don't speak Greek, right? I don't speak Greek. I got this wonderful book. I got a computer, man. It's real easy to find out what the Greek says, all right? Uh, but uh, the Greek combination of two words makes up compassion. The two words for the, that are in the Greek that make up compassion are suffer and measured. Suffer and measured. It's a measured suffering. What do you mean by that? The priest could not condone sin. Okay, He couldn't say, well, okay, you know, you can get away with it this time. I understand your past. I understand your upbringing. We're going to let it slide. Okay? He couldn't condone sin. Uh, and by the way, Love and compassion towards people is not a condoning of sin. It's not an overlooking of, well, you're living a wicked lifestyle, but because I have to love you. I, no, that's not, what it, that's not what love and compassion truly is, okay? So it's not, a, it's not a condoning of sin. But you also have to think about this. He also couldn't be too severe on sin. He, he had a fine line he had to walk. He had to deal with them gently. Kid gloves. Kindly. Forgivingly compassionately. He had to be able to understand people, but not indulge them in their sin. There's a, there's a difference between somebody, you know, talking to you about maybe something they're doing and you saying, I understand, and then saying, but. <laughs> Scripture says. There's a difference between that and just going, oh yeah, okay, I, I get why you're doing it. Go ahead. 
<laughs> we'll just sweep that one under the rug, right? This, this, this compassion is a measured suffering. It's, it's, I don't agree with your sin. It's wrong, but I also have to handle you gently, okay? And, and let, me just, let me just go ahead and say this, okay? I'll just say this tonight, okay? This is the Wednesday night crowd, so I'm probably preaching to the choir. Um, and we talked about this a lot on Sunday in, in detail, Sunday morning, okay? There are a lot of people in this world doing things that are absolutely 100% against the Word of God. As a Christian, we should take a stand for right and against wrong. However, we still have to take a stand in kindness and love. Okay? As we talk about making space at the table and everyone's welcome in the family, right? We don't get to put restrictions on who we feel God will forgive and who we feel God will not forgive. We don't get to put restrictions on who we think are qualified, okay, uh, to, to have our friendship as a Christian, okay? That's not our decision. We do things in love. We do things in compassion. And some of these churches that you'll see that put a bad name on many churches, they're out there picketing the funerals of, of soldiers or, you know, ha- ha- holding hate, hate signs, you know, God hates certain people. That's, that's, that's garbage, and that's not what Scripture teaches, okay? It's not what Scripture teaches at all. We take a stand, but we still do it in love. And by the way, people know that. People can see that. People know when you take a stand in anger or hatred. uh, And they know when you take a stand but still show love. You realize this. um, I'm just going to say this. I might spoil spoil this for myself. But... um, We've been here three, just over three years, three years and a few months or something like that. Do you realize that in three years and a few months, as your pastor now, I could say some things from this pulpit that aren't necessarily kind, but if said in love and for the right reason are received. Does does that make sense? Now, that's not like, well, I'm going to do what I want and get my way. and that's, what, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm saying is just there are things now, once you've, once you've earned and shown respect and earned and shown love and, and, and built a relationship and a rapport, you can talk about some things that need to be talked about that aren't easy to talk about. And when it's done in love, it's well received. That's within the church. So, so think about how much more we can apply that without, outside the church. Measured suffering. I don't agree with what you do in the area of sin. But I love you, and I'll help you through it if you'll let me. I'll give you scriptural teaching if you'll let me. And and I'll be kind as I can be to you if you'll let me. That's what the priest had to do. So his approach was not, you know, I'm the priest. Listen to me. I'm the priest. Do what I say. I'm the priest. If you cross me, I don't offer your sacrifice. That wasn't his job. Okay? His approach was, I'm compassionate because you know what? I'm a sinner too. I'm a sinner too. Uh, And I understand what you're going through, where you're coming from, what you're struggling with, and what you're dealing with. But let me give you God's perspective on it. And let me help you in a scriptural, biblical, godly way. Uh, That's what he had to do. That was his approach. That's the earthly priesthood. Let's look at verse uh, 6 and 7. Verse 6 and 7. As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. We saw the earthly priesthood in the first few voices. Look at the heavenly priesthood, okay? Again, this, this changes now because this is the comparison made earthly priest, you know, Aaron, and then the priesthood to follow versus heavenly priesthood. Christ and Christ alone, okay? Uh, In contrast to the earthly priest in the line of Aaron, Christ is our heavenly high priest. When the Jews heard the statement that Jesus Christ is the high priest, they would often ask the question, well, does he meet the qualifications of a high priest? Because the high priest had qualifications to be appointed by God. And so many times the Jews would ask a question similar to that. Well, if he's our high priest, does he fit the mold? Does he pass all the tests? Does, does he check all the qualifications off on his scorecard? Here's the awesome thing about Christ. Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> Above and beyond, a hundredfold. Yes, he meets all the qualifications. 
as you think about the heavenly priesthood, and you see a couple kind of a couple of thoughts kind of similar to the earthly priesthood. Look first of all at his selection. His selection. Who selected Jesus to be our heavenly high priest? The selection didn't come from man. The, by the way, what does Scripture say? The, the ones he came to save were the ones that, that hated him and turned him away and rejected him, right? They didn't pick him. Look at his selection. You see it in verse number 6. You see it later in verse number 10 as well. Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. You see it in verse number 10, uh, which we won't read tonight. We'll get to it next week. But uh, look at his selection. First of all, our Savior, Jesus, was divinely called to serve as high priest by God. Just as Aaron was called by God. So a comparison is made there. It was a selection. It had to be, he, he had to be perfect. Had to be sinless. Had to be spotless. Had, had, to, had to be God and man. <laughs> There's only one person that could fit the mold, right? Only one person that could check off the qualifications. And it was Christ. As evidence of his calling as this high priest and being selected as that, two prophecies were fulfilled. Two prophecies were fulfilled. I'm going to take your attention. If you, if you want to turn there, you can. We're going to go back to the book of Psalms for just a minute. I did not put them on the, on the screen because just a couple quick verses. Um, but I want to show you the um, Old Testament prophecies that then were fulfilled by Jesus Christ being chosen as our high priest. Selected, okay? Uh, the first one is this. His position as God's son was declared. Psalm 2-7. Psalm 2-7 says this, I will declare the decree, the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So upon him being selected as the high priest, this prophecy was being fulfilled. He was being named as God's son. By the way, this is not the only passage in scripture that calls Jesus the son of God. Okay, there are there are multiple, multiple, multiple ones. And so and, and so for some people who who try to teach, you know, he was just a prophet, a good man, whatever, miracle worker, good preacher, whatever. They're, they're missing the entire. The entire universe of who God is, who Jesus is. OK, he had to be God's son. All right. And scripture calls him that scripture refers to that his duties uh, proved that he was his character proves that he was everything about him proved that he was. And now this selection as high priest fulfills this prophecy that is found in Psalm chapter two. Uh, his position is God's son being declared. Secondly, his appointment as priest after the order of Melchizedek was declared. Uh, Psalm one hundred and ten. Psalm 110, let me get over there real quick and I'll read you the verse. Psalm 110 and verse number 4. The Lord has sworn and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Prophesied in Psalm, when he becomes our high priest, prophecy fulfilled. And by the way, you see a lot of that in scripture. You see prophecies in the Old Testament fulfilled in the New Testament, okay? Uh, this, is, this is wonderful, this is wonderful. Uh, so so his, 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 his appointment or his selection, uh, it, it shows us a couple things. Number one, he was divinely called, just like the priest had to be during, during Aaron's day. Uh, number two, uh, prophecy was fulfilled with this selection. As God's son, sitting and ruling at the right hand of God, his calling as a priest kind of only comes natural, doesn't it? I didn't read these verses, but Psalm 110, before it gets to the order of Melchizedek, says this. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand until I make thine enemies a footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. In the beauties of holiness, from the womb of the morning, thou hast the dew of thy youth. Just think about it. Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. He's got the, 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 the position of ruling and reigning with Christ. This is just kind of a natural thing. This is, this is not, not a big deal, right? This is not like a stretch. Well, that guy, I don't know that he could make it. He's ruling and reigning with Christ. He's God's son. He, he, he's got power and glory and majesty. This is just fitting. This is just fitting. So two prophecies fulfilled. And, of course, uh, divinely chosen as the high priest, just like Aaron's. So that's his selection, uh, the heavenly priesthood. Look at number uh, letter B here. We'll close with this thought. Look at his sufferings. Remember we talked about um, 
suffering with, with, with uh, the, high, the earthly high priest, measured suffering. Uh, look at verse number uh, 7 again of our text in Hebrews. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication, with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared. His sufferings. I put down just, just two, two quick thoughts. Okay, First of all, if Jesus was going to properly understand, be compassionate with, be sympathetic with, and help us deal with our sorrows, our heartaches, and our burdens, he needed to understand suffering. He needed to understand suffering. Uh, Jesus, our heavenly high priest, is able to understand us because he himself suffered. And by the way, when you read scripture, what does it say? When we suffer, we, we join in the fellowship of his suffering. So just like he's an example to us in many other areas, he's also an example of suffering. And the child of God needs to understand this. We're not exempt from suffering. And when we deal with it, instead of complaining about it, getting upset about it, getting mad at God, wishing it would change, how about, how about Lord, I'm in fellowship with you. You suffer, and I'll never scratch the surface of your suffering. Not even come, come close to what you had to deal with. So, Lord, draw me closer to you in my suffering. Teach me through my suffering. Jesus had to understand suffering if he was going to be our high priest and help us in our suffering. He qualifies, amen? You talk about somebody who suffered, Jesus suffered. Uh, so his sufferings, uh, he had to learn to deal with, with suffering so he could help us deal with ours. Uh, number two, or, through his suffering, Jesus learned to understand the human condition which qualifies him to serve as our high priest. He understood uh, the sin nature of man. He understood temptation. He understood loneliness. He understood weariness. He understood betrayal, right? He, he, he dealt with all of that. If you look at um, Mark chapter 14 and verse 32 through 34, it says this. They came to a place which was named Gethsemane. He saith unto his disciples, sit ye here while I shall pray. He taketh with him Peter and James and John and began uh, to be sore amazed and to be very heavy. Jesus in the, the most crucial time of his life, right? He knows what's coming. He knows what he's facing. His, he's bearing his burden now to the Lord. And in verse 34, he saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. Jesus is dealing with probably the most painful part of his life. And he knows more physical, emotional, mental pain is coming. And he, he goes into this garden to pray and to pour his heart out to God. And he takes his close disciples with him. And of course, we know the rest of the story, right? He tells them, watch here while I pray. And one comes back and they're sleeping. Wow, my best friends sleeping through the most difficult time in my life. Huh? You talk about understanding. Jesus understood. Just like that earthly priest had to learn to uh, say, I, I, I don't condone your sin. I understand what you're going through. I understand your difficulties. I can't condone it, but I'll handle you with gloves because I understand. Jesus learned to understand our suffering. He learned to understand our, our, our human condition. And because of that, he qualifies as our high priest. No questions. Uh, greater than any earthly high priest, Jesus qualifies and was our heavenly high priest. What we're going to do is next week, we're going to pick up in verse 8, 9, and 10. So we're just going to look at three verses next week. Uh, and it'll kind of come right off of that thought about him being our heavenly high priest. Uh, and we're going to look at, because of his priesthood and what he did for us in becoming that, we're just going to look at the topic of salvation. Okay, now I know we're not going to tell you, you know, you need to get saved. I think it's Wednesday night crowd. We probably all are. But we're going to look at uh, what, what it means here in, in Hebrews. And, of course, kind of tie that in with the fact that he's our high priest, which provides that opportunity for us for salvation. Okay? So that's where we'll be next week, just covering those three verses. And then we'll, we'll get to the rest of the chapter here soon. Okay? Uh, so that's where we'll be next week. So I'm thankful that we have a great priest, a merciful priest, a wonderful priest, uh, 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 the, high, the greatest high priest of all time. And I'm thankful he rules from the heavenlies. Amen? And that's our Savior. And uh, we're so thankful and grateful for that tonight. Do we get all our blanks filled in this evening? Yes? Got them all? Question? Yeah, ma'am. Yeah. God is left-handed. Does Jesus on his right hand? Well, you might be in for some fights with that one. But <laughs> my dad always used to tease. My dad always used to tease a lady in my church that was left-handed, that the devil was left-handed. And so she had the devil in her and I guess, you know, you get all that kind of stuff going. It's just fun, fun stuff. But yes, ma'am.
Mm -hmm. It's spelled differently. Yeah. Too full. Ah. <laughs> Possibly, depending on what kind of wine it was. Was it fermented or not? That's a debate for another day. <laughs> it's a debate for another day. We're not going to cover that tonight. <laughs> We're not going to cover that tonight. Thank you, though. <laughs> Amen. Anything else? Yeah, there's a lot of spelling of different names, even of even of uh, regular people, not with a name like Melchizedek. Yeah, Isaiah. You know, you see it spelled three or four different ways. So yeah, that's not a that's not an uncommon thing. So. All right, all right. Let's pray. We'll get out of here. Father, we thank you tonight for your love and your goodness. Thank you for being our heavenly high priest, uh, Lord, who is at the right hand of the Father, uh, Lord, who intercedes on our behalf, who. Uh, puts us in position to have fellowship with God, uh, Lord, who forgives us of our sins, Lord, who fulfills the role of great high priest better than anyone ever has in history. And Lord, we're so thankful that uh, you love us and you've uh, been, been, uh, been fulfilling that, that role in our life for so long, Lord, and it's never going to stop, Lord. We'll be with you even in heaven, and we're just so grateful, Lord, that uh, uh, you, you are greater than everything, greater than the uh, greatest earthly high priest, Lord. Thank you so much for uh, fulfilling that role in our lives for us. And Father, we ask you tonight as, as we just dismiss, we go home, uh, we ask you to bless us the remainder of this week, Lord. Uh, i got half the week left, so may we live for you. And again, may we point people to Christ. May we shine our lights. And Lord, we just ask you to bless us as we prepare for the weekend, Lord. Uh, the Sunday morning service, Lord, the potluck, the, uh, the Sunday sing, Lord. We just pray that you'll bless every aspect of our services on Sunday. We pray that it will honor you and please you and you'll be lifted up. And uh, Lord, again, may we live for you now this week and to make a difference for the cause of Christ, we pray. We thank you for all you've done in our lives. We thank you for what you'll continue to do. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Goodbye. God bless you. Shake a hand or two on your way out and see you on Sunday.